The Library Channel presents Lucy's Legacy, Preserving the Search for Human Origins, featuring Nancy Dillette, Richard Toon, Jane Meinshein, and Rob Spindler, with introductions by Daniel Gilfillan, Bill Kimball, and Donald Johansson. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Daniel Gilfillan, the Acting Director of the Institute for Humanities Research. I'd like to welcome you to the exhibit opening of the Lucy's Legacy Archive Project and to say a few words about the multidisciplinary collaboration that has made this stage of the larger project a reality. <coughs> the exhibition and larger archive project are the result of collaborative research efforts between the Institute for Human Origins, the Public History Program, and the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, Archives and Special Collections of ASU Libraries, the Museum Studies Program in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change, and their work represents the type of transdisciplinary research that the Institute for Humanities Research seeks to engage and support through its competitive seed grant program. Each year, the IHR holds two rounds of seed grant competitions. These grants further advance faculty research and often improve the quality of grant proposals to external funding agencies. The IHR supports those projects that advance the transdisciplinary, collaborative, and issue-focused mission of the, of the Institute and that have strong prospects of receiving external funding. With its focus on creating public access to a rich and diverse archive of research materials stemming from Don Johansson's discovery of Lucy in 1975, the Lucy's Legacy Project clearly engages with the IHR's mission of focusing humanities-driven research across disciplinary boundaries and within a collaborative and transdisciplinary frame. The IHR is very pleased to have supported this initial step and what, could become a, and what can become a multidisciplinary digital humanities project. And we look forward to participating in the next stage of the project's development. I'll welcome Bill up. Thanks very much, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bill Kimball, director of the Institute of Human Origins here at ASU. And uh, this is an interesting project for a number of reasons. Um, you might wonder, you know, why is IHO's documentary archive worth preserving? And the answer to that question, in the way I see it, is, is pretty simple, actually. While there are many people around the world who study human origins, there are very few organizations, entities, whose sole mission is to document our link, to the, our evolutionary link to the past. And there are even fewer organizations that have a 30-year history in doing this kind of work. And IHO is perhaps, I don't want to be too categorical in this, but perhaps is the only organization with a history of more than three decades uh, that uh, marks the history of this discipline. IHO not only studies human history, but in the sense we actually create history as well, because the activity of our researchers, our public outreach programs, and our training leaves a documentary trail that marks the transformation of a science from one that was solely concerned with recovery of artifacts and bones of our ancestors to one that today is all about bringing together diverse, multidisciplinary, international teams, large ones that span the globe, literally, uh, for the benefit of creating a complete story of our uh, scientific story of our emergence. And IHO leaves behind uh, a, a rich documentation of that maturation process. So for the future of science, historians and others who are interested in understanding how we came to where we are in the study of who we are, IHO provides a very unique resource. And we are very pleased here to have such fantastic partners um, to preserve this uh, documentary archive for the future. My very pleasant uh, task today is to thank our partners in this, and uh, I must start by acknowledging uh, IHR, the Institute for Humanities Research, 
who uh, created the seed grant that enabled us to even uh, assess whether our archive was something that would be worth preserving here at ASU. And for that, I thank Sally Kitch, director of IHO, and Dan, who's Dan, who's <laughs> standing in for Sally while she's on, um, on sabbatical. Thank you both very much for your support of this. And Kathy Holliday, assistant director of IHR, uh, who's uh, always a very strong uh, source of support. Uh, as Dan mentioned, there are a number of organizations that are partnering together to make this project possible, in addition to IHR. I want to thank uh, Nancy Dillette, uh, who is the Assistant Director of the Public History Program in the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, and it's her advice and expertise that helped get this, helped get this project off the ground and help us connect with the other entities on campus for its, uh, for its support. Uh, with the ASU Libraries, Rob Spindler, uh, the University Archivist and Head of the Archives and Special Collections, is going to be helping us put together a major grant that will take this early stage look at IHO's archives into a rather sophisticated uh, program to, to, to fully document and preserve it for the public. Uh, Carrie Porter Brace, Chief Exhibits Curator. Uh, of ASU Libraries also has helped with the uh, library exhibit exhibition that you can see here. Uh, panel member Richard Toon of the um, Museum Studies Program, director of the Museum Studies Program in Shesk, is always full of good ideas about how to move IHO's public outreach agenda forward and is an important partner in this exercise. And Stephanie Crow. Uh, the research specialist has been on loan from uh, the, the, the Center for Biology and Society that Jane Meinshine uh, directs over in the School of Life Sciences, and we thank both Stephanie, who's been a frequent present around, presence around IHO, uh, helping us to assess the collection and uh, what <coughs> size job we basically have before us, and thank Joan for her, uh, Jane, sorry, for her, um, for her uh, cooperation. Lastly, I want to thank um, Julie Russ in IHO, uh, who seemingly creates um, extra hours in the day. I don't know where they come from, but on the IHO, on the IHO side, uh, she's just a, a just been a, an amazing source of support and energy for this project as well as many others. So she deserves a great. Uh, many kudos for your efforts for this project and others. So with that, I would like to introduce Don Johansson, uh, the founding director of IHO. Uh, most of you know him as the discoverer of Lucy back in 1974, which uh, became sort of the, the, German, the germinal idea behind IHO. And his own career of some 40 or more years maps very neatly onto the majority of the history of IHO. And Don's own personal uh, archives will form an important part of the IHO uh, document of the history of our field. Don. Good afternoon, everyone. I can't thank everyone again, so I will thank you all uh, for your efforts. This really grew out of a, a late afternoon conversation with Julie, who's right back there, Julie Russ. Uh, I like to stick, stay behind in the office and skip the traffic that we have in this valley. Uh, and uh, I talked about, what am I going to do with all this stuff? Mm -hmm. okay. I'm, I'm one of those collectors. And I was put on the hot seat recently and asked, why do you collect? And uh, Bill and I have known each other since the early 1970s when he was a student at the Western Reserve where I taught. And I got to thinking about that, and, um, you know, humans collect stuff. When was the last time you were in your parents' attic and saw the cast from your broken leg when you were in eighth grade or something that's rumbling around up there? Humans like to collect and possess things, don't we? And if you're an archaeologist and you go out and you dig up a site, you find out, God, see, collecting all this, I mean, we're really digging up garbage, most of us as archaeologists, but it's littered with used tools, it's littered with half-eaten bones, it's littered with carbon samples and fireplaces and so on. So I think that this is probably one of the early motivating forces in human origins. Once we began to settle down and have a home base, we started collecting stuff. 
Uh, Bill is often referred to me as more than a collector. He says, boy, he says, you hoard up a lot of stuff here. He thinks I'm sort of a, what would I say, um, what is it when someone is an obsessive collector? Pack rat. A pack rat or something like that. <laughs> well, I, you know, I've saved all those airplane stubs from all the flights I was on. I saved stuff from my childhood. Uh, I saved stuff from everywhere. And uh, it, it really is in that respect, about me, because there are lots of things in the old days, you know, we used to make carbon copies of letters uh, or Xerox copies of letters and so on, and they're all there. And I happened to come into the field of paleoanthropology in 1970, which was a pretty critical year in African paleoanthropology, because things were beginning to be found all around Lake Turkana, uh, and in northern Tanzania, no one had really looked in northern Ethiopia. And during this 40 years or so that I've been involved in the field, it's been a very dynamic field. So there's a lot of personal stuff that uh, will reveal some of the uh, aspects of how this field developed over the years. Uh, some of it is going to go into a box sort of Mark, Mark Twain, because you remember Mark Twain wrote, wrote an autobiography not to be published until his death, <laughs> or a hundred years after his death. So there'll be some things that will be, wait, will wait to open after my death and some other people's. Um, but Julie really said, we've got to do something to organize this. I've got drawers filled with clippings and notes and lectures and personal letters and so on and so forth. And really, because of this, the wonderful efforts on the part of IHR, uh, we uh, are at a, in a position now where we can develop not only Lucy's legacy, not only the Institute's legacy, but also my legacy. And I feel very good and very rewarded about that. So uh, at this point, we're going to put together, I guess, a major sort of proposal to uh, see how all of this should be archived. Uh, and it, as I said, it's, it's, it's very pleasurable for me to know that these things will be here. And the last thing I want to say is that the final part of the archive, the final piece of the archive, uh, is in my will. And I am going to be skeletonized at the University of Arizona's medical school and articulated with wire. <laughs> And you know Lucy in the plastic case you've seen upstairs, right? Where we where she is standing. I'm going to be next to her at the Institute of Human Origins. And it's going to be my last pun, because underneath is going to be Donald Johansson found her. <laughs> Okay, I'm Nancy Dillette with the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, the Public History Program. And I also want to thank um, IHR for funding this and Julie Russ for bringing us, us all together. Um, the purpose was really to figure out what's in the collection. What do we have here? And uh, that's been done so very well by Stephanie Crow and Rob Spindler. So thanks to them for helping us to bring intellectual to control over this collection. We, kn we know what we have now. And the finding guide is, is the result of that effort. And the next step, as we've heard, will be to get some funding to uh, move it along to the next stage. So my role as a public historian here was really to make another set of inquiries about this collection, um, to think about its significance, and to set out another set of questions. Um, what does this collection tell us? And what are the strengths and weaknesses of the collection? So while IHO is involved in the big questions about what it means to be human in the paleoanthropological sense, um, my questions are focused much uh, in a much smaller realm on what values do we bring to the study of science and how is that reflected in the collection of uh, Don Johansson. So, so far we've been able to spend only a little time because of our very busy schedules and uh, 
the travels that Don is always involved in. But we have been able to interview him twice about the collection and the nature of his collecting. And um, so I've begun to think of this as um, how do we help people in the future to, as they approach the collection, understand how it was formed, what it meant, and and what to think about it. And um, it's not often that when you approach an archival collection, there's sort of a message in the bottle from the collector. But that's how I'm thinking about it, and that's how our interviews are being structured. And we're really just at the beginning of this process. So I just want to share with you really just some anecdotes at this point. We're not pooling together the big uh, the big the big story yet, but um, in our couple of interviews with uh, Dr. Johansson, we've, we've had a sense of how he's beginning to think about it. And it's exciting to watch him um, put his mind around looking at what he's done and what it all means. So um, the message to the future, I think he would say, what does he want people to know? And you know he's filled with humor, but what he says is, how did a pimply kid from Hartford do all this? Why did a young, serious, headstrong kid make up his mind and say, I'm going to do this? So that's part of what he wants people to think about. Who's the individual behind this collection? Where did these um, very large ideas and a large sense of possibilities come from? Um, and he's going to tell us to look for some of the answers by reading Aldous Huxley in the 1950s. I haven't begun to reread that, but if he says that that was something that really inspired him, then I'm going to begin to do that. Um, he's also very interested in biographies and autobiographies. And, of course, they're always <coughs> most interesting when they're about successful people. Um, Agassiz did not have correspondence. Darwin did. And Don Johansson does, too. So on the nature of collecting, he says, and I'm quoting here, I've always been a collector. Butterflies, insects, test tubes with salamanders, postage stamps. I lament the fact that it all has been lost, especially the correspondence between my mother and father. So it raises questions with, that we want to fill in later. Well, tell us about that relationship. I do have the love letters from my first love 51 years ago. There's something poignant in having them. I've schlepped those letters about for all these years. If someone writes a biography, those letters would be important. Again, we want to tap into what does that mean, if he'll be able to share it with us. Um, and he, he worries. Um, what do you do with newspaper articles? I'm worried about cassettes, VHS, beta. What do you do with IBM cards? And I wish I could turn the clock back 40 years and marry an archivist. <laughs> so what does he think future researchers will know from this documentation? Um, and I think what we're beginning to find is that the focus on the emergence of the field is really, really important. And his correspondence um, started when his career really jump-started in 1973. And he thinks it's vitally important, and we're beginning to see that in this collection you really can see that it's important to understand who was being communicated with and for what purpose. So the scientific findings are happening on one level, but keeping in touch with the sponsors and the donors and apprising them of the significance of the findings is every bit as important. I think the most important thing that we're discovering is that it's, re it's really the social and political context of the science, the development of the science. And a quote from him that I think says it all, um, our field is highly contentious and filled with vigorous people. I love vigorous people. The lengths to which people want to manipulate certain aspects of the story is almost Machiavellian. How do we convince people to get their papers to us with assurance that no access will be provided in their lifetime. Of course, that makes us wonder, you know, what are these controversies that can't be revealed until death? How do we share with the public that we're not only always white-coated scientists and that our personal lives and egos and rivalries are also shaping the field? So those are the kinds of things that I think in the future um, the archive is really going to help us to understand much better. What are those rivalries? What caused them? 
How did they play out? How were some careers made and lost? Um, very important are the efforts to keep him out of Ethiopia. What was the impact of that? Um, battles with, with um, other vigorous folks, let's say, and what he calls, in quotes, the scientific crime of the century. So lots to unpack with that. Um, the public understanding of science is very important. Um, he wants to share this story. Not all scientists take that tack. Um, his, his fascination with the relationship to apes is infectious, and it makes us, <coughs> it makes us all be curious about that. And, um, and Lucy is the kind of ongoing fulcrum of his career. As he says, he'll always have that. Nobody can ever take that away. In the nature of fans, um, I find it remarkable that he has uh, responded to every fan who has sent him a letter. Um, and why does he do that? He says he does that because you never know which child will truly be inspired and turn out to have an important career in the field, so you respond to them all. Carl Sagan told him, you're going to launch a generation of scientists, and that stuck with him, and so did the letter. Have we found the letter, Julie? No. No. Hmm. Okay, well, we're still looking for that letter. And then the question we pose to him is, okay, you get the letters and then you respond to them. Why do you keep the letters? And he says, in his interesting, funny style, validation. Um, he talks about not quite realizing that being a scientist um, could preclude popularizing and that he risks something to do both. But in his estimation, it's okay to popularize, popularize as long as you have the integrity that goes along with it. Um, that's a really important thing to a public historian and to, to all discipline, disciplines, really. If you're totally on an academic track and <coughs> not communicating with the general public, you know, many academics take that route. But lots of um, our, our public intellectuals and our public spokespeople for the disciplines are really important to us. And we have to understand what makes uh, the very few that take that role. And not only are rigorous scientists, but really believe that the public understanding of science is as important. Um, so the long-term legacy. Um, one of the things that I'm beginning to think about is how do we begin to understand the world that we live in now in terms of globalization? Um, there's been a long history of trying to understand the environmental movement, movement, and lots of people have studied that, and we understand the movement and the legislation and the various things that bring us to where we are now in terms of natural resources. We live in a global world. We're only just beginning to understand what does that really mean. And I think there are a couple, we're going to want to start um, identifying what are those events that allowed public consciousness to know that we were beginning to live in a global world. Um, I'd love people to start thinking about that. From, from my perspective as a child in, in 1955, I remember, or a little later, I think it was published in 55, a little later reading um, a book published by, it was photographs by the um, Museum of Modern Art called The Family of Man. And that was my, that was my first inkling that I share culture with everybody. Uh, we went to the moon, we saw shots of the moon, and we all realized we've got one planet. Um, Lucy was discovered, and we got a sense that we have a common ancestry. So what are some of those other things that, that we can put into that context to really start understanding the global world that we live in? Um, and lastly, I'd just like to say that um, <coughs> this is just the beginning. We have a lot to learn. 
Uh, as I said, we have some control now over the, the physical and the intellectual properties of the collection. Now it's time to really delve into some of, the, some of the meaning and how we think about making it accessible to researchers in the future. And we have a great opportunity here at, um, at Arizona State University to think about how do we engage other luminaries in their field. I think it's fascinating that we have IHO on one hand and we have the uh, human art, no, I'm thinking Lawrence Krauss and Dark Origins Matter, Origins project. the Origins Project. Mm -hmm. How do we think about um, attracting that kind of luminary in the public understanding mm -hmm. of science in such diverse ways and uh, begin really thinking about how we uh, preserve and steward those collections? So I'll turn it over to Richard Toon from Museum Studies. Okay, um, I think I was involved in the interviews with Don and Nancy has summarized that well, so I think I should just apply for the third position next to Lucy and Don, you know, hanging on the wall there. <laughs> but I will say a few things about my role in this, which was to really think about uh, what's the implications of this archive as far as exhibitions goes. Um, I first got involved with the Institute of Human Origins a few years ago uh, with the exhibition called Becoming Human, 30 Years of Research and Discovery, which you all went to, I, I know. Um, and it was part of a year-long celebration of the Institute of Human Origins 30th anniversary. So we're sort of following on from that. And I'm thinking about the diversity of the materials in this archive and what does this mean in itself for uh, a popularizing, a reaching a broader public, a, um, and looking back, what's the relationship between an archive and a collection? Um, so it means really thinking, what does an archive mean? What, what, what is an archive now? Um, and we have a traditional sense, it's a neutral repository of facts, often uh, particularly in documentary form, uh, as a resource for scholarship, and that's probably going to remain its sort of central function. Um, and it's certainly the case here. But uh, if anyone just saw the exhibition outside that was put together here, uh, there's a lot of other material. Some of it quite wacky. Mm. Um, and in this material, looking at this material and all of its diversity, there are all sorts of choices to be made. What's required to be kept? What should be kept? What is important? Um, how should it be organized? How should it be categorized? Um, how, and this is where I'm interested, how can it and should it be used in exhibition? Um, and my thought is that exhibitions tell stories and the archive contains many rich and important stories which Nancy has talked a little bit about. Um, but there are some sort of big chunks of story. So the, there's definitely the story of Don's discovery of Lucy, but there's also the, the story of the development and the growth of the Institute for Human Origins uh, and the amazing work that it's done and is still doing. It's, it's, it's an archive with itself a continuing story, and I think that's really important. Um, there's also, to me, the role of Don as a public intellectual, and how is that story to be told? Um, Don has actually been involved in the development of exhibitions, and it's a sort of uh, turning in on itself to think there's a role to think about what is it to do that? That's a good topic for an exhibition. What is it to be a public intellectual in this day and age? Um, and, um, and the element that Nancy talked about, which is done as a proponent of a, the cultural importance of stressing our shared humanity. I actually wrote in my note, shared humanities. Just must be the funding that made me think of that. <laughs> um, so what I'm saying is that the users of this archive will tell many different stories for different purposes, for different publics, for different users. Um, and it's a rich and varied collection of materials. Um, 
comes in many forms. There are documents, photographs, recordings, videos, and, and artifacts. And there's a lot of talk, actually, in sort of, I'm just learning this in archival science, which I hate to comment on, but uh, the idea of the postmodern archive that is no longer that traditional notion of merely uh, documentary materials, that there is a meeting of the archive and the collection. Um, I was recently in New York at the Fales Library, and it looked to me that their collection of the downtown art scene, that it looked like the back room of uh, an art gallery. It looked like a collection. It was a collection of art work, and it's about the process of art making. And it struck me that the traditional distinctions between archives and collections is in many ways breaking down. And that's an area, I, I, you know, who knows where all of these materials can and should end up. But there's a really important question of these kinds of collections um, start to raise questions about the very nature of the archive. So, there's no simple distinction, I think, between the notion of collection and archive. That's, and that's w where the museological comes in. So one of the great potentials of these materials, and as you saw, uh, just you, as you see in that exhibit outside, uh, is that it has the potential to tell stories you can walk through. Telling stories you can walk through is what an exhibition is. Um, and it's a rich material. Um, and it can tell stories that a public, a general public, that aren't themselves scientists or know much about science can relate to. And I think it's really important to draw and promote through that um, the, the cultural and scientific importance that the archive comprises. Um, so how we do that? Um, well, I think that's the problem for the library. <laughs> Sorry, I feel the need to come up here because I want to see everybody. <laughs> maybe maybe it's from teaching. I'm paranoid what the people behind the post are doing. So sorry to make it harder for the camera guys to adjust. But <laughs> so, so my assignment is to look outward a bit from this collection and connect it to other things. And as a historian, I think a lot about what to keep and then I throw most of it away. Um, but, but I don't want him to throw it away. So I want the people I study to keep the stuff, the right stuff anyway. And that's the hard part, figuring out which is the right stuff. Um, is it all of those boarding passes, really? <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of the interesting no, no. project. Yeah, oh, okay, okay, okay. So I want to tell two quick stories. Um, briefly mention the project that we're working on and then come back to a moral about how it connects to this to this work. Um, just two stories about my own experiences. So when I was a graduate student, I spent a lot of time at the Yale University archives because I was studying the work of Ross Harrison, who was working, he was the very first one who did tissue culture and got it to work. And so there had been a question about how did he get it to work? And the publications didn't really show it. Other people had tried all the same things, it looked like, based on the publications. It was really only in the archives, using those white pieces of paper with the holes punched in them so that we couldn't steal anything, with the lead pencils um, in the archives for hours. It was only in the archives that I discovered notes from Harrison that he wouldn't have thought were important. Mm -hmm. So my idea that I should know what's important is a stupid one, really. He wouldn't have known were important. That showed that while his office was being redone and they were creating the, the new lab space for him, he was temporarily put in with the bacteriologist. Now this isn't really recorded anywhere except in some notes. But while he was there, he learned about bacteriological techniques and aseptic techniques, which allowed him to develop tissue culture. He didn't write that down anywhere. We wouldn't know that anywhere except from stuff hidden away in the archives. And so it was an extremely good lesson that 
that others will find different kinds of information than you expected. So Don has stories, you mentioned stories that we know we're going to want to look at, but hopefully in 50 years somebody else will be asking different questions and find different stories as well. Then a different kind of story, the Marine Biological Laboratory is a place I've spent a lot of time, and in 1988 it was their, it was their centennial. And so somehow I ended up writing something that I called an autobiography, so a historical collection of stories and, and photographs. And I knew that a lot of people were going to be really ticked off that they weren't in it. Um, so I just explained in the introduction and said, this is an autobiography and everything in here is documented in the archives. So if you're not in here, you should <laughs> donate stuff to the archives. Well, within a year after that, over 10,000 photographs and a whole, bunch of, a whole bunch of other stuff was donated to the archives, which kind of made the librarian upset because they had to add a room on. But that's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So there, hopefully, with this collection, we have what what Don's giving, but hopefully, this will accumulate, and people will see reasons to add other things that are that are related, and will enrich and enhance the collections as well. Mm -hmm. So those are two stories about archives. The project that I work on that Stephanie Crow is part of um, is <laughs> a, a big vision. Um, it started with the Embryo Project, which to, was to write everything about anything to do with embryos from Aristotle until tomorrow, um, which was a modest project. <laughs> um, but it got bigger than that. So it started with a seed grant from the IHR, which... I wrote down one place was $1,000, <clears> and I wrote another place was $5,000, and I don't have a good record of how much it was, actually, because I'm not good at keeping my own records. Uh, you can probably tell me. But it's led to over $3 million of funding for our project. So that was a pretty good investment, and I hope that this project will have equal success um, as well, and that you'll have millions and millions to build what you need. Oh, sorry, Carl Sagan. Billions and billions. <laughs> <laughs> to spend what, or to build what you want. So we've built something called the History and Philosophy of Science Repository, which is now, we've been working at the MBL and the project is there, but it'll be moving to ASU and hopefully will become a project with the library with the data repository here. It includes something called the Embryo Project, which involves a lot of student writing projects and and, and other things, um, and also MBL History Project. Uh, it's all digital. I mean, they're pa pieces of paper and stuff, but, um, but we're digitizing it. And we're working with a digital process that's also connecting the items in the collection through relationships, so there's a computational part and that part of that is promissory notes, and someday it'll be great. And one of my colleagues goes, oh, we can do whatever. Yeah, well, someday. But the point is that having a, a physical collection, building a digital collection that's digitizing some samples of the whole collection and doing it in the right way, where we're building on the kinds of manuals that Stephanie's been helping us to develop so that from the beginning we have protocols and manuals about every step from when the stuff gets collected and curated, how it gets digitized and which things get digitized and why, how it gets archived, how we're connecting, what we're choosing not to do that we know we need to do later. All of that stuff is part of the process. So any project needs to work on you know, the metadata, the protocols, the organization, the manuals, and all that sort of thing. And no project is an island. So here we come to the moral. You know, This project is going forward. You have wonderful librarians and archivists to help. But we have other projects at ASU that we're working on. So Stephanie's been helpful. And we hope that we can continue to be helpful and be partners. And we'll learn from you. And you'll learn from us. And I'm really excited as a historian and philosopher of science about this project because hopefully we can help to make the collection even richer and then we can use it and find all the cool stuff in there. So, <laughs> thanks. Excellent. Well, it's my job to talk in some specifics about what archivists do and what we did specifically in this project and I'm, I'm very grateful to a very talented archivist, Stephanie Crow, for her courage in stepping into a very busy, productive, 
scientific research environment and getting enough information to really position us to make this material available and to make what was, a, what is a series of file drawers, rooms full of material, boxes full of material with just the slightest labeling into a useful research collection. And I, you know, I wrote a bunch of details down here about Stephanie's survey work, and it's all, you know, it, it's very interesting. We've got about 140 layers <coughs> feet of material. We've got all kinds of formats and uh, of material, some of which are becoming obsolete and require some preservation care. But I think what's particularly interesting about this is that some of this material is the organic product of IHO of Dr. Johansson. We call those archives. Those are the organizational records of this activity. Then there are the things that were collected by others. And so archivists talk about personal papers, we talk about organizational records, and then we talk about collections. So in some ways, what we have is a collection of collections here. We have records, we have personal papers, and we have things that tell us more of the broader context of this information. When we started this project in March 2012, was I believe the first meeting of, of our working group here, the vision was to position ourselves to establish a digital humanities project. And our perspective as archivists is that you have to understand the forest. Uh, to be able to keep track of who owns what, who has the right to see what, how can these materials be used in many other ways than they were originally intended. And that's ultimately the great thing about archives. We talk about secondary values. An object, an item was created for one purpose. It can be used in many others. Our ability to document those contexts and document those permissions widens our ability to use things in many, many ways. And one of which is, in fact, the creation of a digital library project, a digital humanities project. So ultimately, what Stephanie did, um, starting in August of 2012, was she came into the archive. She, we, we call this a collection survey. And the goal of the survey was to identify groups of material by function, format, or sometimes just location. We had a room of stuff. And each, each of those groups we call record series. Um, and then for each series, we said, okay, how should this group of stuff be arranged so that people can find things and so that the relationships between specific items in the collection are preserved because we find there is collective value in bunches of stuff. We understand research methods. We understand publicity. We understand how an organization makes decisions when we look at groups of things and how they relate to one another. Um, then within each series, we go through and we measure things. How many linear feet do we have? Uh, what's the inclusive dates and years? Uh, is it well arranged? The file drawers in the library were alphabetically arranged by topic and subject. That really helps us. Other materials were not at all arranged, and these are places where the archivists have to come in and create an arrangement for a material that makes sense. Um, what are the subjects represented in the material? So people uh, looking for information on field anthropology methods and how they've changed over time can find things in this collection, will be pointed to this collection. Um, what are the <coughs> preservation concerns of the various materials that we find? And then uh, what are the really cool items that we discover along the way? One of the really neat things about museum work and exhibit development is that you get the opportunity to identify cool items <laughs> or those things that have a special significance and then talk about that broader context um, in the interpretive work of the, of the exhibit. Um, we love that. We love context. We think context tells a bigger story than the object itself. And so that's why collections and documenting collections is so important and it adds value 
to these these many many individual things. So about 100 linear feet of material, 140 linear feet of material. The predominantly mixed personal papers and IHO organizational records, which creates the, the necessity to be sure that we have the support both of Dr. Johansson and IHO in moving forward with this activity. Um, portions of the collections well arranged, portions not. Um, another interesting discovery was that some of the material is considered what we call active records. They are records that are being actively used by this office in the conduct of their daily activities. Our job is to figure out what's active, what do they need access to on a regular basis to do their work, and then what's inactive and appropriate for the archival research collection that we bring in and make it accessible. Um, <coughs> Ultimately, uh, in December and January, uh, once we had the survey report, which was a fine report of 12 pages, we took that textual document and then we started boiling it down into real numbers about how many boxes and folders and sleeves we needed and we could establish costs around that. Uh, we have a, a tool, a survey tool that we use to establish that. That in turn enabled us to put real dollar figures on the investment necessary to successfully preserve and catalog and make accessible this important material. <coughs> that in turn enables us to write a competitive grant proposal that would enable us to get those resources, successfully preserve the material, catalog it, and make it ready for many scholars over many years to come use these things. That in turn enables us to think about what should be digitized. What are the richest parts of these collections? And what are the things that the scholar, remote scholars in particular are going to need access to? And the really fun part about that is, is this problem of abstraction. When you begin to pull portions of a collection out, do you lose that context? Is it sufficient to digitize some of a collection and not all of it? And these are the kinds of issues that I know that Jane is dealing with in, in her work and we're dealing with every day as we go through the many collections that we brought for your use here at the ASU Libraries. So hopefully that will give you some of a clue of the really hard work that Stephanie has done um, over several months and uh, the, the challenge that we face in preserving not only paper things, but also the, the vast quantities of digital materials that are being uh, made every day. Thank you.